Hello, everyone. You're listening to Truth Cat Radio at truthcatradio.com. The current time is 8.02 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's East Coast USA. Although I'm broadcasting from Chicago, USA. And my name is Richard Carey, and this is Beyond the Matrix. I'd also uh, like to say hello to JP and everyone uh, at Wolf Spirit Radio. Uh, we have a simulcast on Wolf Spirit Radio. I wanted to say hello to, to all those listeners as well. Well, tonight we have Michael Rivero uh, joining the program once again. Um, we're very, very excited to have him here again. Uh, very shortly, we're going we're gonna to begin uh, his interview. I just would first like to mention to all you out there that we are completely listener-supported. Uh, we are not accepting any corporate advertising, and we are not monetizing. All our archives are free. Um, so if you can, please support our station. Uh, we have a support page on our station website, www.truthcatradio.com, and PayPal is accepted. A lot of people like the convenient and relatively secure method uh, of PayPal transactions. So any, any amount you could spare, you know, sometimes just a little bit of loose change after the bills are paid, you know, sometimes adds up and really helps keep us in the black, you know, keep everything running here. A lot of great hosts, guests, and information that, that we want to keep, keep sharing with you. Okay, well, um, that being said, I do want to also mention, uh, please uh, do like our pages on Facebook. We do do most of our promotion currently with the, the social media assistance of uh, Facebook. Uh, so please like our pages for Truth Cat Radio, Truth Cat Beyond the Matrix. And uh, we have a news group, Truth Cats, a lot of people seem to like as well. If anyone wants to call in, any questions for Michael tonight, the call-in number will be 714-598-3125. That's 714-598-3125. Or for our international listeners, um, you can, uh, on Skype, call Stephen Kelly at stephen.d.kelly, K-E-L-L-E-Y, uh, and he could bring you in as well. Uh, if we do uh, bring you in, I'll just ask you to speak by your area code. And once again, please help out and support the station with whatever you can. Now then, Michael, uh, thank you very much for being with us here tonight. Well, thank you for having me again. Oh, yes, yes, uh, definitely. Uh, it's always an, an honor. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we had uh, you on once before, and uh, just for the listeners who might not be aware, uh, Michael Rivero is the host of the What Really Happened radio show on the Republic Broadcasting Network, and he's webmaster of whatreallyhappened.com, now in its 24th year, I believe that would be. That's that correct. Right? Wow, that, that is really, really remarkable, Michael. Yes, I'm an old guy. <laughs> 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 well, no, I mean, you know, your your services are are greatly appreciated by by some of us out here. You know, I'm a, I'm a, a continual listener of your program for a number of years now, and I really can't say I've I found any program out there that's that's anything like it. You know, well, thank you. But you do seem to to vet your sources very well, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I I really trust you know just a lot of the. Uh, the information and callers as well that contribute. Uh, I, just uh, to continue the description, though, um, I had here, uh, well, what really happened as opposed to war is a presumed fix for the struggling U.S. economy and also takes a look at issues of science and health being distorted in the quest for profits. Both the radio show and website continue to enjoy a large and growing audience. And um, what I think a lot of people might not be aware of is you're a past with NASA as well, Michael. I mean, it is a really impressive background to, to wind up in the truth media. Well, I, I didn't actually intend to wind up in the truth media. Uh, I started out my life wanting to be an astronomer, and I worked for NASA. And then following uh, Apollo, uh, NASA's budgets got cut, and uh, I, I found myself uh, unemployed, but I'd also had a short stint as a child actor. So a friend of a friend of a friend who knew about my strange dual background of uh, having worked in TV and knowing all about these new microcomputers suggested I pay a visit to this little uh, cinder block building in Van Nuys called Industrial Light and Magic. And it was a classic case of being at the right place at the right time. And I walked on into the very beginning 
of the computer revolution in filmmaking. And I wound up working at places like Robert Abel and Associates and Hanna-Barbera. Uh, and uh, I, I just had this amazing career up until 1994 when I was uh, uh, d just quite by accident. I saw the photo that was released by the White House showing purportedly the hand of Deputy White House Counsel Vincent Foster with the gun that he supposedly killed himself with in Fort Marcy Park. And since it was my business to know what makes things look real on TV and movie screens, I looked at the picture and I immediately said, this is a fake. It's a staged shot and a very badly done one as well. So like a good little law-abiding citizen, I tried to call attention to it, see something, say something. Uh, and the next thing I knew, I was blacklisted out of Hollywood. Uh, my reputation was being smeared. And all of a sudden, I began to realize just who it was I was actually up against. And by the time I realized what I had <clears throat> stumbled into, uh, it was already too late to turn around and go back. So since I all of a sudden had a lot of spare time on my hands, I started looking more into the Foster case. I found how the FBI was falsifying witness testimony, including that of uh, the widow, uh, Lisa Foster. Hey, and it, it guys, began to... Guys, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm really sorry to interrupt. Michael, I, I have a lag... But you just said that you were working for Industrial Light and Magic? Uh, I worked for them briefly in the very early days when they were still in Van Nuys. Okay, I just got to tell you my Industrial Light and Magic connection. I worked for a company called uh, J.L. Woods back in the 70s, the late 70s, early, very, uh, but somewhere like about 1980s. Anyway, we made optics, and Industrial Light and Magic used a super catadair optic uh, telephoto lens for splicing all of their, uh, you know, those films, you know, they, all those layers. And it was because, and I, I'm just saying, it was. It, we use a special cylinder lenses to make these things. And the thing is, is that nobody realizes that before there were, could be Star Wars, before there could be any of that, they had to be the industrial light and magic to make, to make the to do the filming and before they could do any of that stuff there had to be these these uh, these lenses had to be created so yeah, i got the optical printers well for the when they line up all the for instance the layers the different like you know one layer's got a star a battle ship on it one layer's got a, a stars on it one layer's got a, a star destroyer you know that kind of a thing yeah that yeah, with, and with the mats and the holdouts and the counter mats, and it was right. all done in these optical printers. And uh, and I, I actually worked with some of those machines in, in my very early career. No, I just remember it was just kind of funny because uh, long before you know anyone knew anything about Star Wars, we were working with Industrial Light and Magic to make these these lenses for so that they could make those those crazy special effects. And I just so it's just so when I run into somebody who's actually involved in with them way back in the day before any of this, before Star Wars existed, I I like have a little special connection so that's all okay but no i'm familiar with, with with the process you're talking about and i think i remember the name of the company as well uh you mean jl woods actually? yes oh yeah, yeah I, I think they provided lenses to uh uh the optical printers we had at robert abel yeah well, i think we did uh the lenses for the uh what is it panaflex also yes yeah those were the days <laughs> now it's all digital yeah you know. all, all feels like working in a Dilbert cartoon now. <laughs> it's funny. All right, back back to it, Richard. I've got to make myself some tea. I'm gonna. I was actually getting ready to start vacuuming, and I heard uh, back when I was Industrial Light and Magic. I'm like, what? <laughs> Sorry. Sure, okay. sure, Steve. All right, Michael. Well, I think you were uh, talking about how you, after losing your career in Hollywood, uh, for speaking out about the Vince Foster uh, case abnormalities, you, you started looking into that further. And, and I started looking at all kinds of other things. I, I, I started building, you know, I, the, the website was uh, originally a sub page on my animation business website, and I spun it off to its own domain. And over the years, just more and more information came on out. Then there was the Oklahoma bombing, the shoot down of TWA 800, and the website grew and the readership grew. Uh, and we had to leave Southern California because we were getting uh, death threats, and we lived very briefly in the Cascade Mountains of Washington State. And then I got an opportunity to come to Hawaii and work on a motion picture for a Japanese production company, which really didn't care that the White House hated my guts. And so Claire and I came here, and uh, I actually uh, did get my film career back for a while. Uh, I wound up as a uh, visual effects producer on the TV series Lost for four of the seasons. I did the, the pilot of the new Hawaii 5.0. I did the, the first season 
of off the map. And then I reached a point because I was getting older and the website and the radio show were just taking up so much time and there wasn't enough Michael to go around. And so I really had to make a choice of saying, uh, I, I can really only focus and do justice on one. And so I decided, yeah, I'm going to let the film stuff go away uh, and just focus on trying to avert what was, even back then, a very obvious rush toward a new world war, which I think is a bad idea, especially because I think the U.S. is going to lose this one. Certainly. Yeah, avoiding war, you always do point out, is a, and I agree, a very important motiva motivator um, for, for you to, uh, well, I, I'm sure there would have been more money if you took the other path. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I didn't really get rich in Hollywood, but uh, I, I was doing better than I'm doing now today. But still, uh, it, you have to make that choice. What are you going to do? Make TV shows and movies about saving the world or actually try and wait on in and save the world? So I went the latter course. Well, that's, that's brilliant. And um, yeah, as I said, I, I do avidly keep up with your broadcasts. Um, like when the uh, information about the... So um, what I called Obama Gate, uh, yeah, but um, you know the wiretapping um, investigation, wire, Donald Trump wiretapping investigation. I I kept uh, a lot of you know points and and notes I heard you and others mention on your show. You know I filled in a lot of my listeners uh, on that and and the Seth Rich information that was coming out. Basically, uh, yeah, trying to you know continue the uh, the flow of the independent information for. For you, I wish a lot of more, a lot more people would would join the bandwagon on that. But um, well, a lot are. That's the really good news. I mean, uh, if you look at the uh, corporate media right now, they're losing their audience. They're losing their readership. Some of the big uh, corporate media websites actually got exposed about a month or so ago. They're using Chinese click bots to artificially inflate the readership numbers of their websites, which basically amounts to they're defrauding their advertisers. Uh, but they're they're hovering at the edge of bankruptcy. Uh, and they don't know how to get their audience back because they're not allowed to start telling the truth uh, all of a sudden. So instead, they're, they're basically, they've declared war on the independent media. We had the Washington Post that came on out and said that all of the independent media websites are arms of Russian propaganda, which I thought was a real giggle, especially when the Washington Post had to retract the story later on. And we even had a coffee mug made up to commemorate that. Proud member of the Washington Post list of arms of Russian propaganda. Uh, which is the best way to deal with that. But uh, you know, they, they try and get our advertisers to drop us. Uh, there's constant hacking attacks on my web server, uh, hacking attacks on public broadcasting. Uh, there are a lot of very scared people out there. And especially right now, uh, the hearings that we had before the Senate committee yesterday and today uh, were supposed to be the one-two knockout punch for Donald Trump by the anti-Trumpers. And in both cases, the hearings fell apart because... Uh, even though the media is still out there trying to say, well, James Comey felt he was being pressured and all this other innuendo, when you actually listen to the hearings or read the transcript, it comes on down to where they say there is no evidence that Russia was uh, interfering with our elections. Uh, there were no votes changed by Russia. Uh, Donald Trump did not order the end to any investigations. Nobody in Donald Trump's administration ordered the end to any investigation. There, there's absolutely nothing there. And the corporate media is sitting there with egg on their faces for having been pushing Russian hacking and Russian collusion all these months. And they're trying to find some way to salvage what's left of their credibility. Uh, and, of course, the other issue, as you mentioned before, is Seth Rich, where... Uh, they're still out there pushing that Russia hacked the DNC servers, even though their one and only piece of so-called evidence that Russia was behind uh, the leaking of those DNC emails has now been retracted by the company that created it, CrowdStrike, saying they misread the data, they don't really know. Meanwhile, there's a very strong circumstantial case. Seth Rich was the leaker of that information to WikiLeaks, and that's coming uh, from Seth Rich's cousin, uh, other members of Seth Rich's family, uh, some of the people who were in the pipeline. Uh, Julian Assange uh, strongly hinted that Seth Rich was the leak. Uh, and if you look at all those leaked DNC emails, they stop just the day before Seth Rich was killed. So there's a very strong case there. But again, the corporate media is out there screaming tinfoil hat and conspiracy kook because if it, the American people do come to understand it was a leak by Seth Rich, then once again, the corporate media is left with egg all over their faces for pushing this Russian hacking story. And the, the corporate media, 
their trust in the corporate media and for that matter the government is at an all-time record low it's never been lower in the history of this entire country and everything that they do the next lie Assad gassing his own people what on else it's just eroding it that much faster and there's this, almost a sense of panic within uh, the boardrooms of the corporate media and within the, the government because they've lost their ability to lie to the public with impunity and much of their power and control was based on that being able to lie, trick, and deceive the American people into paying higher taxes, into sending their children off to these wars of conquest, and now it doesn't work anymore. And they don't know what else to do. They've survived on lying to the American people for so long, they don't know any other way to govern. And so that's why you're seeing so many indications of panic inside Washington, D.C. And aside from all the infighting we're seeing, uh, domestically, uh, we have we have so many, as you say, uh, little buildups. Uh, I guess you could call it to to World War Three here. I, I guess we've had a, an update on Syria. Is, isn't that just happened, came in? Well, uh, uh, Syria is rapidly escalating. As you know, the U.S. forces have now bombed Syrian forces uh, three times. Uh, that's a dangerous escalation. The U.S. is justifying it, saying that, well, we've set up these illegal military bases inside Syria, and we've drawn a line around them, and if you come inside the line, we have a right to bomb you, which is absolutely illegitimate. There's no Security Council resolution for these deconfliction zones. Damascus has not agreed to the deconfliction zones. Damascus has not agreed to allow the United States to set up bases inside Syria. This is an all-out, undeclared war, invasion, by the United States government against the government of Syria. And it's simply a continuation of this five-year attempt to get Assad out of power. And the U.S. government keeps changing its story. Oh, Assad is gassing his own people. Assad is okay. We're actually there for ISIS and al-Qaeda. Back and forth. And every time they change the story, again, their, their credibility suffers. And, and just um, the whole claim of Assad gassing his people, um, it was used a couple of years ago, right? The, the multiple times. And it's just like you, there's no motive, right? You want to look for a what should be there and isn't, as you put it, right? Yeah, that's exactly it. Uh, and uh, again, we're coming out of this claim that Saddam had nuclear weapons, which turned out not to be true. Uh, and then in trying to get us to go along to war uh, in Syria, uh, Obama and John Kerry were claiming that Assad was gassing his own Alawite supporters, which made no sense. And in both cases, the U.N. chemical weapons inspectors came on back and said, no, these were the U.S.-backed rebels who were carrying out these gas attacks in order to frame Assad. And then this most recent one in Idlib, the story just did not make any sense because Assad is winning against the U.S.-backed rebels. Uh, the international community was basically getting comfortable with the idea of Assad staying on. Uh, and there was absolutely no reason for Assad to do the one thing that would allow the U.S. government to, to say, let's go on back in and try one more time to get Assad out. Uh, Assad had nothing to gain from this chemical attack and everything to lose. And so, obviously, it was never really him. And yet, all the government knows how to do is lie and tell more stories. And the corporate media, of course, their job is to just repeat the government lies in the hope that if they repeat them often enough, people will just simply say, oh, I guess it must be true. I've heard it so many times. But the American people have become very skeptical. They become very analytical. They understand they're being lied to about uh, Saddam's nukes, about the torpedoes in the Gulf of Tonkin, about a Spanish mine in Havana Harbor. Today, of course, was the 50th anniversary of Israel's attack on the USS Liberty. And the American people have come to understand the U.S. government lied to them about that, that Israel intended to sink the USS Liberty. They wanted to frame Egypt for it to get the U.S. to come in on the uh, war on uh, Israel's side against Egypt. And the U.S. government just covered it all up. And the American people have just reached the point of saying, you guys are lying all the time. There's, there's nothing true coming out of Washington, D.C. They're rigging the unemployment numbers. They're rigging the stock market trying to make things look good. And it's just time to stop listening to them at all and go to this peer-to-peer, citizen-to-citizen, citizen, changing of information uh, in order to find out what's really going on. And there's a very strong parallel with that with the Soviet Union in the months before it collapsed. Because as the Soviet people, especially following Chernobyl, came to understand the degree to which the government was lying to them, they started sharing information among themselves, peer-to-peer, -peer, using fax machines. They didn't have computers, they didn't have an internet, but they did have fax machines, and it was called the Samizdat, 
where people were just writing articles. They'd put it in their fax machine. That would send it to 10 other fax machines. The people there would take the article, send it on to another 10, 10 times 10, times 10, times 10. And people were just feeding inf information all over the Soviet Union. And the Soviet government tried to find a way to shut it down, and they couldn't. And eventually it reached the point where the Soviet people simply stopped listening to the, the, the Politburo, and the Politburo started to collapse. And I really do think that that may be uh, what's in store for the U.S. federal government. Nobody listens to them or trusts them anymore. This is rapidly becoming a government that can't even function any longer. And unfortunately, their only solution is to try and start a bloody war all over the globe in the hope that we, the American people, will throw, forget all about the crimes and corruption and the abuse and just throw a snappy salute at the flag and fling our babies onto the designated bayonets. Well, and we have just all these little, little wars festering and just lingering on, like waiting for a big flashpoint, I suppose. Because, I mean, there's now uh, something in, in Qatar that, that this began. Yeah, this Qatar situation has just blown up incredibly unstable, and it feels like somebody miscalculated because we're seeing a dramatic realignment of nations within the Middle East. Turkey has surprisingly come in on the side of Qatar. Iran, of course, is trying to get humanitarian aid in there as well. Uh, the uh, Qatar's foreign minister is meeting with Russia's government uh, this weekend, uh, and it almost looks like that World War III, the hot war, may actually begin with Qatar, Turkey, Iran, and Russia, possibly China on one side, against Syria, Saudi Arabia, and the United States and its allies on the other. And we need to be very concerned about this. We need to be screaming to everybody who will listen. We should not go to war because Vladimir Putin came out with a very accurate observation. Uh, he was being interviewed by Oliver Stone for an upcoming uh, series uh, that's going to be on Showtime, I think. And Vladimir Putin said, we should not have a hot war between the United States and Russia because nobody will survive it. And he's absolutely right. If you look at the sum total of all the nuclear weapons held by the United States and its allies, if you look at the sum total of nuclear weapons held by Russia and China, along with the stockpiles of biological and chemical weapons, we're talking extinction level event here if this spins out of control. And it's already out of control. If you remember back in 2005, Wesley Clark blew the whistle on the U.S. war agenda in the Middle East. It was supposed to all be over in 2008 with the conquest of Iran. And here we are, 2017. We're stuck in Iraq, we're stuck in Afghanistan, we're stuck in Yemen, we're stuck in Libya, we're stuck in Syria. Uh, we can't get any traction anywhere, uh, and the U.S. is rapidly running out of military stockpiles. Uh, their latest generations are overpriced junk, and this, this is not going according to the plan. And unfortunately, from the point of view of the war hawks, their thought is, we've gone too far, we can't turn around and go back, or the economy will implode. And so, unfortunately, it does look like uh, they're heading on toward an absolute disaster. And, of course, from their point of view, they've got bunkers. Uh, the taxpayers have bought all of these, uh, built all these giant underground bunkers for the government, and the bankers have their bunkers. And they're all thinking they're just going to go on down there if it gets out of control and come up in a year and a half, and they'll have planet Earth all to themselves. Well, um, yeah, I, I, I can't uh, s see how they could really imagine that could work out just as they want like that i i would think that everything would still be radioactive up here i can't see them living down there forever but <laughs> no they, they 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 can't but you need to understand the a lot of these people are caught up in, in these these beliefs these visions of a better future and they're they're not being objective and they're not understanding uh the consequences of their action and uh, they're out there with this, this group think that nobody dares go against, that the, uh, the, the U.S. is unbeatable, uh, that uh, uh, the, the nuclear war can be uh, winnable. Uh, and, uh, the, of course, we didn't win in Vietnam, and we didn't actually win in Korea, and we certainly didn't win World War I and World War II all by ourselves. Uh, and so uh, looking at the situation and how poorly the U.S. has been doing against these relatively helpless nations, the idea of going up against a, uh, an actual military peer like Russia or China, uh, it, is, it is absolutely insane. And, of course, for the American people, it's very frustrating because one of the issues Donald Trump campaigned on last year was to get out of all these foreign entanglements 
and we get Donald Trump in there, and I agree with some of what he's done, but not all, because all of a sudden the war hawks are back in control. It almost seems like the Pentagon has actually gone rogue, uh, and they're just out there deciding America's foreign military policy all on their own. Uh, and, and Trump, unfortunately, is not actually in control of the U.S. government anymore. And so, of course, they want to be sure they can sell Americans on, on a hot war uh, should it arise. So I, I entitled the, uh, the discussion for today COINTELPRO 2.0 and Deep State Corruption. And um, I don't know if, um, you know, well, I mean, you know, you mentioned uh, your age. Um, I myself am uh, 40. Uh, I know a lot of listeners out there might be even younger still. Um, and might not be aware too much of, of the original COINTELPRO. Um, I was reading your article on it again uh, recently. And, well, I mean, it, it, it's, very, it, it's, it's very fascinating how it, it seems like it's everything getting like just ramped up again and repeated. Uh, well, I think the reality is it never really went away. I mean, when the original COINTELPRO scandal was uh, exposed in the 1970s, Congress was forced to hold hearings because we got uh, we, uh, a lesson that the FBI was not this wonderful bunch of heroic Americans that we see on films and, and TV shows, that it was in fact functioning as uh, an American version of the Gestapo, there to enforce the will of the rulers. And the original COINTELPRO, uh, the FBI was going on out committing sabotage against Americans uh, who were merely exercising their First Amendment right to uh, freedom of speech, and um, there we go, uh, the uh, exercising their right to freedom of speech, uh, and they were sabotaging groups like the anti-Vietnam movement, the civil rights movement, uh, early feminists, the Native Americans, uh, and they played a lot of dirty tricks, one of the most famous of which was the Black Panther coloring book. And the FBI's goal was to fan up racial tension between the whites and the black population so that they would not unite in common opposition to the war in Vietnam. And so the FBI had this uh, so-called Black Panther coloring book, which was filled with images that were just racist and violent, showing black people killing white people. And they spread it all over the country and while the media said, oh, this is what the Black Panthers are handing out to children, which was an absolute... Uh, absolute lie. And it did succeed. Uh, the American people were very gullible and naive and trusting back then. And it did inflame racial tension. And it kept the white people angry with the black people so that we couldn't unite in opposition uh, to the war in Vietnam. Uh, another uh, very famous uh, aspect out of COINTELPRO was called the day the Yippies took over Disneyland. And that was basically where uh, anti-war protests were being organized on all these Southern California college campuses. And the original plan was they were going to march along Anaheim Boulevard or Harbor Boulevard outside the Disneyland theme park in Anaheim, California. And they bust everybody down there and the march started and the leaders were saying, they're not paying attention, they're not paying attention. Let's go inside, let's go inside. And they leapt over the turnstiles and led the protesters inside and proceeded to just create a huge amount of ruckus. So the police showed up. The National Guard had actually been stationed nearby. And the next day, there were newspaper photos all over the country of those gosh darn dirty hippies beating up on Mickey Mouse. And as it turned out, the entire thing was an FBI operation. All of these leaders on the college campuses that were organizing the anti-war protests were undercover FBI informants on the college campuses. And by the way, if you're college age right now, they're still doing it. The FBI has informants among the students on those colleges. So the smelly kid who insists he can get your dynamite to blow up a building, that's probably the FBI informant. And it just discredited the anti-war movement by portraying them as not being peaceniks, but just being violent in a different direction. And it allowed the Vietnam War to continue until finally we lost 60,000 Americans and the war itself. Uh, that, when you speak of the Black Panther Party, it reminds me of that excellent interview you had on your show before with the, that one member of the original Black Panther Party. I don't know if a lot of people are also aware of, you know, just well what he had to share, basically, you know, I mean, and how much difference there there has been, um, how much of a threat to the establishment the original party was and this new Black Panther Party. How, if you could maybe uh, explain that to the listeners uh, for a moment. Well, believe it or not, the original Black Panther Party started out as, as a nonviolent group and their original agenda was really very simple. 
They wanted guaranteed breakfast for the ghetto children so that they were well fed when they went to school. And they wanted local control of the school curriculum, which seems to be an issue that comes up every single generation about whether a community should decide what curriculum best serves the community's interest versus the federal government saying, well, you're all going to be learning what we think you ought to be thinking. And that was basically it. But it was the FBI's infiltration of the Black Panthers uh, and their attacks on them uh, that basically turned them militant and turned them violent. And that was what the FBI wanted to have happen to destroy public sympathy for what the Black Panthers were trying to do. And that's, uh, that's always a very common thing that the FBI will do. When you have a group that's out there talking about a, a real need for social change, such as the early feminists or the Native Americans, they'll infiltrate the group and start doing acts of violence so that the public turns away and stops listening to their legitimate grievances. Oh, we're not going to listen to them. They're, they're throwing trash cans through windows and things like that. And the FBI has been continuing that same uh, behavior up to the present time. Now, in the 1970s, when uh, Congress had to hold hearings on COINTELPRO, uh, the FBI promised they wouldn't do it anymore. Congress actually passed a few laws saying the FBI can't do this. Uh, but those laws were very quietly repealed during the Bill Clinton administration. And the church committee found out that the FBI is still engaging in these kind of actions. And we're seeing it even today, where undercover FBI informants will find some easy-to-influence kid, talk him into uh, staging a terror attack, then they'll arrest the guy for the headline value. Six months down the road, the judge throws the case out of court as obviously being entrapment. But at that point, the headlines have been out there, and everyone's being sold on this idea of the domestic terrorist threat. Yeah, I, I know you uh, covered a lot of details about the, uh, the Sarnia brothers um, as far as a, a more recent incident. Um, yeah, you mentioned a lot how a lot of just the information didn't add up. It's a good, uh, good example, but um, I mean, yeah, just showing how far back this goes to the 1950s, you know, for the people oh, out been, there. Yeah, it's been, it's been going on all along. It's been going on my entire lifetime. And uh, the, the term of craft, of course, for all of this is a false flag attack where the government will stage some kind of an incident to blame on a group to be targeted for uh, domestic repression uh, or elimination. Uh, there are strong indications that the bombing of the Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City was a false flag. The Boston bombing was a false flag. Uh, and again, the American people are starting to really look very closely at all of these stories and realize that the facts don't add up. And I'll give you one really good example. Uh, Zokar Tsarnyev's attorney, so-called defense attorney, literally walked into his trial and she turned to the jury and said, he did it, he's guilty, which is, I think, a lousy defense. Uh, had I been his lawyer, I could have gotten him off for a very, very simple reason. If you look at the remains of the two uh, pressure cooker bombs, they were in black backpacks, dark, I mean, absolutely jet black, with a very recognizable white square patch on top. The photos of the Tsarnyev brothers at the location of the Boston bombing show one of them wearing a white backpack and the other one wearing a gray backpack, and they're both much too small for the pressure cooker bombs. Meanwhile, there are photos of these other guys who were there uh, in black jackets and khaki pants. Standing uh, apart, you wouldn't notice them, but when they're standing together, it's obviously some kind of an organized group. One of them has a black backpack with the white patch before the bombing, and after the bombing, the same guy was photographed without the backpack. That right there would be your reasonable doubt, but it was never allowed to be presented in the courtroom. Because the official story is it was the Sarnia brothers. Ooh, bad, bad Sarnia brothers, terror, 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 terror. But we unfortunately live under a government where that's all they know how to do. Lie to the people and trick them into doing what the rulers want them to do. And we see a lot of people now trying to come down on the, on the freedom of speech uh, throughout the Internet and in general. Um, but I mean, I don't know. Michael, uh, what do you think in the long run? I mean, a lot of people I hear are, can be optimistic, just like the printing press. You know, you eventually can't stop. Too many people know about it now. You can't take it away from the people, right? I agree. I agree. Uh, we're, there are strong parallels between what we're going through now sociologically and what was going on back when Gutenberg reinvented, uh, rediscovered movable type printing. And all of a sudden, books were affordable to the middle class and literacy exploded and people were taking it upon themselves to learn what was going on rather than simply sit back and let the kings and the priests tell them what to think. And as a result... Uh, society had to change. Those institutions uh, 
that couldn't adapt to the new reality of a better educated public uh, had to, uh, they, they went out of business, basically. Those institutions that could adapt, uh, they, they did. They're still with us. And we're seeing the same thing right now. Uh, institutions, whether it's business, corporate, religious, governmental, they're going to have to get used to the idea of a much better inf informed, peer-to-peer -peer communicating, skeptical population. Uh, or they're not going to be able to survive. And unfortunately, in that latter category, I would include the United States government, which is carrying the burden of 200 years of lies, fraud, and deceptions. And they're, they're trapped by that burden. They can't just stand up and say, yes, we've been lying to you all for 200 years. Give us another chance. We'll do better. And so I, I really do think that the future of the U.S. federal government uh, is mirroring that of the decline and fall of the Soviet Union. Well, in international relations, uh, it, it does seem like we really are the most lied to people now. I mean, it, it doesn't seem like other nations have much motive to lie to their people as, as nearly as much. Well, um, let's see. I, 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 mean, think, I, I think all governments I, I, lie to their people. It's only a question of degree. Okay. As, as far as international um, incidents, you know, people being in um, other people's territories and why they're there. As far as uh, that information, at least, uh, a lot of the l smaller, uh, more undeveloped nations just don't, you know, I mean, you, you can get the straight news from them a lot more easily. And, well, I don't, I don't know about um, your opinion of R RT's American version. Would you say it's pretty much the same as the, the Russian version or is there a bit of a, you know, a bit well, of a difference? I, I, I haven't been doing a lot of uh, checking because I don't speak Russian and it does take a long time to go through the uh, Russian translate on Google. But overall, it does seem to be uh, more or less consistent. And that is in stark contrast with the American corporate media, which has one version of news uh, for domestic consumption. And then they'll have completely different content, completely different magazine covers for their international editions. And so there's a, a great deal of tailoring of the news for uh, the, these various interests. Various regions, rather. Yes. Um, yeah, but no, I, I, I do see your point as well. I kind of phrased it a little too much of a blanket statement. But yeah, I mean, most leaders have motives to lie to their people about <laughs> some issues. Oh, they've been around. doing it all along. They've been doing it all along. If you ever get to ancient Egypt and you look at the temples built by Ramses the Great, uh, you will see them, in most cases, decorated with these murals of how uh, Ramses II defeated the Hittites at Kadesh. And it was just all over the place. He was using those temples like the ancient Egyptian version of CNN. And it actually was the accepted version of history until archaeologists up in Kadesh uncovered evidence that Ramses II had actually been suckered into a trap by Hittite spies, and he almost lost his army. And he was forced to sign history's first non-aggression pact, and he skedaddled on back to Egypt. And knowing that the ordinary Egyptian people would never get up to Kadesh and find out what was going on, he just put up all these murals and said, I am Ramses the Great and I beat the Hittites. And nobody ever questioned him on it. So lying to people by rulers, has it's a tradition of rulership going back thousands and thousands of years. There does seem to be, though, a, a bit of uh, a more peaceful um, presence in the East uh, of, of the globe rather than the West at the moment, I guess is what I was really getting at. Um, you know, as, as far as everything that your and my generations were brought up to believe, you know, about communist countries and communism, you mentioned the fall of the uh, the Soviet Union. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, if you could elaborate with the, uh, my listeners a little on, on the parallels that you were mentioning. Well, again, uh, I, I, and I'm old enough to remember the Cold War and the propaganda that we were shown in schools to just always hate the commies and not even listen to them. They'll melt your brain if you, you know, let them talk in your ear. Uh, Bert the Turtle, Duck and Cover, and all that ridiculous nonsense here. Uh, but again, uh, the, uh, the Soviet Union, uh, first of all, was bankrupting itself on war. Uh, their loss in Afghanistan uh, uh, basically destroyed the myth of the invincible Soviet military. Uh, and following Chernobyl, where uh, the government basically had to say, yeah, we lied when we told you everything was all OK, that was the beginning where the people began to say, look, we cannot live under a government that is not being honest with us. We can't live under a government uh, that is going to take our children away for wars of conquest for flimsy reasons. Uh, and it, it was only a matter of time before the Soviet Union simply fell apart. And the United States seems to be on the same path. 
Uh, they're bankrupt, hopelessly in debt. Uh, they've been caught out lying to the American people time after time after time after time again. The American people are sick and tired of war. We've been at war in Afghanistan longer than we were in World War I and World War II, and they're already talking about a new surge because they still can't get the country under control. And there is a reason that Afghanistan is called the Graveyard of Empires, because the last military conqueror who actually conquered and controlled all of Afghanistan was Alexander the Great, and he only managed to keep it for three years. So we're, we're in this, this war agenda because every time the U.S. government and the bankers get this country into an absolute mess, they figure getting into a major war, uh, if it doesn't fix the problems, at least it's a distraction. They've got somebody to blame for it. So you go back and you look at the history of our economic upsets and the wars, and you'll see there's a clear linkage. Crash of 1907, World War I. Crash of 1929, World War II. Crash of 2008. And here we are on the absolute brink right now. And then just the amount, it seems that they will deny, you know, that it's a wartime economy, uh, deny the unemployment numbers, um, the amount of cybercrime. It, it seems like the, uh, you know, the three letter organizations of this country are behind most of the cybercrime. Is this uh, what all the information starting to point? Well, to, they're, they're, they're certainly uh, behind a big part of it. Uh, and mm -hmm. the recklessness with which they were handling these uh, tools that they produced uh, has triggered another surge in cybercrime because uh, somebody leaked out the NSA's hacking toolkit. That's now available on the dark web. Uh, CIA's Vault 7 tools are now being uh, leaked on out. Uh, fortunately, WikiLeaks is sending those to the computer security companies so that they can patch those holes. But every time uh, the government uh, bores a back door through your router, your tablet, your cell phone, your computer, soon it's only a matter of time before the cyber criminals will find it and they will use it. And the cyber crime is completely out of control. And our economy is already fragile enough without the seven to ten billion dollar loss in, in productivity every single year. And it almost seems like the government doesn't care. Uh, and it may just be that they've put so much focus on the war, there's nothing else left over to take care of this country. Certainly, if you go down the main street of your nearby uh, town or, or city, you can see uh, it's being allowed to rot from neglect. The pavement is cracked. The metal is corroded. Look at all the retail vacancies. Look at all the homeless and hungry. This is clearly a nation that's in serious, serious trouble. The United States is a nation that is obviously very much in decline. Now, there was this wonderful series on HBO a while back called The Newsroom. And uh, I, I wish they'd bring it back because it was absolutely brilliantly written. And in the very first pilot episode, the protagonist in the show, uh, the anchorman for the news, Will McAvoy, is at this college uh, uh, auditorium uh, doing a, uh, a conference with students. And he's asked, um, what makes America the greatest uh, nation on earth? And everybody answers, we've got freedom, we've got this, we've got that. And Will McAvoy says, we're not the greatest nation on earth. We used to be, but we're not. And we need to recognize that and deal with it. And he goes down all the lists of areas where we are so far behind the other countries. And we're not going to rebuild America's greatness with a new world war. And if anything, a new world war will be the end of the United States, in my estimation. You also mentioned the difference in uh, approaches to military budgets and spending with the, the current Russian um, gov government and here in the U.S. And I don't know if people realize, you know, just just how extreme it could be. Maybe um, you could explain to them some of the things you cover on your show about that. Well, when you take together the uh, the uh, official Pentagon budget, the added budget for the ongoing wars themselves, and the various black budget programs that are held uh, secret everywhere else, the, the majority is the U.S. government is spending most of its money on war. More than 50 cents of every tax dollar being paid in is being spent on the machinery of mass death. And it, it is a huge amount of money. It is very wastefully spent. Uh, if you go back to 9-11, the day before, 9-10, the day before the World Trade Tower attacks, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld actually got up there at the Pentagon and admitted the Pentagon had lost three and a half trillion dollars. No idea where it went. We're sorry. It was here just a week ago. And it should have been the economic scandal of the decade. But fortunately for Donald Rumsfeld, uh, the very next day, 9-11 happened. And interestingly enough, the airplane that flew into the Pentagon circled around the Pentagon and flew into the accounting offices where they were trying to find where all that money had gone. 
So there's a little uh, head scratcher for you there. So it's huge amounts of money. Uh, the, all of these weapons programs are bloated. We're looking at the F-35, uh, which is the most expensive weapons program in history, and it hasn't produced a really effective uh, weapon platform. Uh, we've got the Gerald R. Ford. They can't get its whiz-bang catapults to work. Uh, the uh, F-22 is still asphyxiating its pilots. The Independence class littoral combat ships corrosion problems. The Freedom class littoral combat ships chronic drivetrain problems. The Zumwalt stealth destroyers, chronic drivetrain problems. Uh, America's weapons industry is all about the money and all about profitability. And Eisenhower warned us it was going to wind up that way. The military industrial complex would become so rich and so powerful, they would reshape the nation's politics to keep the money pouring into them. Meanwhile, over in other countries, uh, they will spend far less money, but it's spent wisely and smartly because the goal of their weapons program isn't profits for the corporations, but actually cost-effective, efficient weapon systems. And that is why the United States spends more for the military than the next 25 nations put together, 24 of whom are supposed to be our friends right now. And yet that huge volume of money is not a guarantee of invincibility. I mean, look at that cruise missile attack that Donald Trump sent into Syria. Uh, most of the missiles missed their targets. And the ones that actually succeeded in hitting the airfield did so little damage, the airfield was operational in less than 24 hours. Oh, that's... Yeah, and, they, and they'll lie, right, about the results of a lot of these, uh, to at least make it sound a little better for their equipment? Oh, absolutely. I remember during Operation Desert Storm, and they were out there... Uh, praising the Patriot missile system. And the Patriot missile system uh, was out there with a, a better than 90% success rate, which doesn't really matter if the incoming threat is carrying biological weapons because it's still going to come down somewhere, even after you intercept the missile. Then they sort of hemmed and hawed and said, well, actually, it was probably about closer to uh, 50%. And then finally, when it was all over, they said, actually, Patriot had performed rather poorly uh, and it only succeeded in hitting its target 20% of the time. Uh, and so all this anti-ballistic missile uh, technology, it's very expensive, and it doesn't really work all that well. The U.S. government has poured billions, almost a trillion dollars, into this anti-ballistic missile defense system involving all these huge radars and all of these interceptors, and they're crowing about the successful test that they'd had about a week ago. And all Russia and China had to do to completely bypass it, to render it all obsolete, was to make their nuclear reentry vehicles maneuverable. So they do not follow a predictable ballistic path. They just bob up and down and weave back and forth and they corkscrew. And that's all it took to completely invalidate because the, the Russians and the Chinese are not investing huge amounts of money rebuilding the weapons that won the last war. They're thinking outside the box about what the next war will bring. And they're coming up with some very scary and amazing things like uh, the Zircon anti-ship missile, which is so fast, even U.S. Navy experts are saying they're not going to be able to stop it. Uh, this is a, a, a missile designed to kill aircraft carriers, and our carriers are wide open to it. The close-in weapon system can't hit it. Uh, nothing that the Aegis ships are carrying can hit it. It's just that fast. And, and yet we're hearing uh, these, all these uh, updates from uh, Paul Craig Roberts and, and his supposed sources, right? It's pretty e extreme. <laughs> yeah, well, it is. Well, Paul Craig Roberts is a very, very serious guy. Uh, I've had him on my show many times. And what he is saying is that uh, apparently his sources inside Washington, D.C. are saying there's, there's actually serious talk uh, about not risking losing a conventional war against Russia, but just going on ahead with an unprovoked nuclear strike uh, in the hope that Russia will be so fearful of a second strike that they won't retaliate. And that is a very dangerous gamble to be making with the entire habitable surface of our planet. And in any event, uh, I think uh, certainly, if not Putin, uh, the hardliners still within the Russian government would say, we have to retaliate. And uh, again, as Putin said to Oliver Stone, we don't want to get there. Nobody will survive it. But you, um, well, you mentioned the, the monetary world shift that's inevitably uh, moving away from from the U.S. and toward toward Russia and China, right? Well, basically what it is, uh, you need to understand that uh, Franklin Roosevelt's deal with Winston Churchill to bring the United States into the war against Nazi Germany was that Britain would surrender 
uh, the pound sterling's role as the global trade and banking currency, off of which the Bank of England made a, a tidy profit, and that Churchill would allow the dollar to take over. And once Churchill was beaten down enough, he said, yes, 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 bring in the U.S., the dollar can take over the global trade and banking currency. So as World War II was winding down, all of the major economic powers met at this luxury resort in New Hampshire called Bretton Woods, and they hammered out the Bretton Woods Agreement, which made the dollar uh, the global trade and banking currency. And this brought tremendous wealth to the United States in the post-war years, because everybody had to come get U.S. dollars, uh, to do any trade across the borders, to buy natural resources, and they either had to borrow those dollars at interest from the Federal Reserve, or they had to bring us manufactured goods and agricultural produce in exchange for these boxes of ink and paper. Okay, so far so good. Now, these nations all agreed to the Bretton Woods Agreement on a couple of conditions. One was that the Federal Reserve wouldn't overprint those paper dollars to simply plunder other nations for their, their products. And second, that the dollar would always be redeemable in gold at the price of $32 an ounce. And that was going to keep it stable. Well, the Federal Reserve isn't actually part of the U.S. government. They're a privately owned bank. Uh, they're no more federal than Federal Express. So they started cranking out paper dollars and paper dollars and paper dollars. So you get to the 1970s. France is looking in their bank vaults, and they're looking at these huge piles of U.S. paper dollars. And so they notified the U.S. government that they were going to redeem those paper dollars at the agreed-on price of 32 of those paper dollars for one ounce of gold. Richard Nixon looked into Fort Knox and realized they had nowhere near the gold to redeem all that paper, and he ended gold convertibility. It was called the Nixon shock. And international demand for the dollar plummeted. A lot of people were very concerned about just how much gold the U.S. had. Could it really collateralize all of its borrowing? And in order to keep the dollar from collapsing, they went to what was called the petrodollar deal, which is where the U.S. went to all the oil-producing nations in the Middle East, and they said, here's the deal. You will sell your oil only for the U.S. dollar so that people have to come get the dollars from us, and you will then invest those dollars back in our economy, and you will make a tidy profit. And in return, we will protect you from the aggression of your neighbors, meaning primarily Israel. And that all went well and good, but as the dollar continued to decline, more and more of these oil-producing nations decided they really didn't like the dollar deal anymore. They wanted to go with a stronger currency. So in 2002, Saddam Hussein got permission from the United Nations uh, to sell Iraq's oil for the euro. And one year later, the U.S. goes on in screaming nuclear weapons of mass destruction. They kill Saddam Hussein, and Iraq's oil is back on the world market only for the U.S. dollar. Then you had more Mark Gaddafi down in Libya who got sick and tired of the dollar deal, and he threw out Libya's privately owned central bank, set up a state central bank to manage Libya's public currency as a public utility, and he invented a new currency based on value, the gold dinar. Then he announced that anybody who wanted to buy Libya's oil would have to pay for it with the gold dinar. So the U.S. goes on into Libya, they kill Gaddafi, uh, they uh, tear down the state bank, put in a private central bank, nobody knows where the gold for the gold dinar disappeared to, and Libya's oil is back on the world market only for the U.S. dollar. But the rest of the world is getting sick and tired of all of this, and you're starting to see all these parallel systems start to form, like BRICS, and the Shanghai uh, Economic Cooperative, and the Asian Infrastructure Bank. And they're starting to come to agreements on trading their currencies directly across the border without going through the U.S. dollar. Well, and Michael, this is maybe we can pick up uh, after a five-minute break at that, uh, okay. at that point, please. All right. That'll be fine. All right. All right. Thank you. Here, we'll just mute for five minutes. And, Stephen, if you would, please. Thank All you. right. Um, no guarantee I'm going to go for five minutes, but I need to remind everybody that this is Truth Cat Radio, www.truthcatradio.com. It is June 8th, 2017. And it is Thursday, and you're listening to Beyond the Matrix with Richard Carey. And immediately after Richard's show, in approximately one hour, will be the Stephen D. Kelly show. And my, and I'll be talking about something non-political, a little more fun. <coughs> Tarot and, uh, what is it, numerology specifically. <coughs> but I do want to advise everybody that, yes, we are 100% listener supported, and we do need your donations because we don't get any uh, people that want to promote what we do here. So we need your we need to uh, <clears throat> we need to depend on you guys, the listeners. So if you guys could please drop a little something in our PayPal every once in a while, it'd be very very much appreciated. And if you want to find where that is, it's on our main page at www.truthcatradio.com. You'll find a page that says support us. That's where you'll find the PayPal, which is Stephen 
kelly714 at gmail.com. We also have a chat room. The button's right next to it. It says Truth Cat Chat. Go in there and register a screen name and say hello. If you would like to join the show and call in and say hi to Michael or Richard, you need to call area code 714-598-3125. That's area code 714-598-3125. If you want to join via Skype, you need to send me a Skype request to Stephen, period, D, period, Kelly. Make sure you indicate that you would like to join the show. If you'd like to be involved with Truth Cat Radio in any way whatsoever, you need to contact me at my email, which is law17gun at aol.com. That's law17gun at aol.com. And beyond that, I'm going to go ahead and cut it short and let you get back to it. But I do want to remind you all that, yes, we are listener-supported. We do need your help. If you are on Facebook, please share our, ad, our ads and please join our TruthCat Facebook page. Very, very important. And also, if you're listening to this on YouTube, give us a thumbs up and a nice comment. And again, share it with your friends. And once again, this is TruthCat Radio. Thank you so much. Carry on. Hello, everyone. And... Yes, once again, this is Truth Cat Radio at truthcatradio.com. And you are listening to Beyond the Matrix with Richard Carey. And today we're listening to uh, Michael Rivero explain a lot of the uh, interworkings, both internationally and domestically. Um, and uh, he is the uh, host of the What Really Happened radio show, which I do recommend you check out the uh the website and and show it's really an excellent source um, where a lot of a lot of minds uh, come together for the independent media. I would like also uh, say hello to to JP and everyone at Wolf Spirit Radio uh, who are listening through their simulcast and I thank all of you for your support as well. And if you could please uh, support us on our support page, uh, we do use uh, PayPal and uh, any any little bit would really help keep keep everything up. Uh, coming to you here completely free of any of the restrictions, including any of the restrictions even of advertisers who can get coaxed away from a lot of the independent media these days. Um, so, you know, this, the, the one price required for this sort of freedom of speech is that, yeah, you, the listeners do help us out. So we do appreciate whatever you can, whenever you can. Thanks again. And Michael, um, I'm sorry, that's a kind of brief uh, break there, but before we were interrupted, we were discussing, um, well, the petrodollar deal that occurred after Bret Bretton Woods um, going off the gold backing and some of the countries that have tried to uh, break away from this wanting a, a, a better deal, you know, for their oil profits and, and their country's ability to prosper on its own. You mentioned um, Saddam Hussein in Iraq. You mentioned Gaddafi in, in Libya. And, uh, well, uh, that, that pretty much came to, uh, to where we started discussing the, what's currently well, been uh, occurring. What, what's currently going on here is, uh, again, much of the United States post-World War II prosperity uh, came from this Bretton Woods deal. Uh, more of it came from the fact that we were the only nation whose industrial base had not been bombed into rubble. Uh, but over time, uh, Wall Street uh, and the economic system actually got a little bit lazy and complacent. They knew there was a guaranteed flow of profit coming in from the Bretton Woods deal. Uh, and because of that, uh, the United States has allowed its manufacturing to decline over the last 30 years. Much of it is now offshored. Uh, and... Uh, as a result, uh, we don't really have a lot of manufactured products uh, to sell that people want to buy. And that includes a lot of our weapon systems, which are now seen as ineffective and overpriced. Uh, coupled with that, of course, is this disastrous experiment with genetically modified food, which nobody wants. It's being banned in countries all over the world. Russia has banned it. China's banned it. Mexico's banned it. Uh, and uh, all of a sudden, we, we have no agricultural produce that anybody really wants to buy. Nobody wants to buy our, our manufactured goods. The only thing still holding the U.S. economy up is this guaranteed revenue stream from Bretton Woods. And now as more and more uh, countries are turning away from using that dollar, this is perceived as a threat. 
And that's why the ultimate aim of this rush to war is a war with Russia and China, because other nations are starting to turn to the ruble and the yuan as much more reliable and trustworthy currencies than the U.S. dollar. Uh, and part of the problem there, of course, is in their effort to keep the stock market propped up. The Federal Reserve is creating literally trillions of new dollars out of thin air. They won't even admit how many they've done. So nobody really has a good measure of just how much of the real value of the U.S. dollar has already been inflated away. So you can see from the point of view of the U.S. government, uh, they're looking at either a complete economic and probably governmental crash or let's go on out and conquer the world and force them to go back to a system where we get rich off of their uh, labor. And I think the rest of the world is saying, no, we're not going to do that one. Yes. Uh, and of course, the, the role of the uh, private central banks plays a role in all of this as well. I mean, it, it, anyone who can compete uh, freely um, is, is, is just someone that that has to be done away with, right? I, I, I do find it interesting that, well, I mean, didn't Andrew Jackson uh, succeed? I mean, I heard there was an attempt on his life that he fended off with a walking stick, a pistol at close range. I don't know if that's a story you've heard of how much uh, oh, no, truth it's, it's, there is. It's that. true. It's two yeah. pistols. It's two pistols. And actually, those pistols are still preserved, I think, at one of the big Wall Street banks. It may be J.P. Morgan. Uh, but the, the, the situation was that uh, when the United States was formed, uh, it had a very revolutionary economic system for its time. And that was the government was going to coin its own money, spend it into circulation to buy what the government needed. The coinage uh, would then flow through commerce without accruing any interest to a central bank. And then it would be taxed back at the end of the cycle in the same amount to balance the books. And it's a system that works for the nation. It's a system that works for the people. But it was a threat to the private central bankers uh, of Europe. And they wanted to bring the United States government uh, under that same slavery. And you need to realize that it was enslavement to a private central bank that triggered the American Revolution. Because when the colonies were first uh, forming up, uh, they were creating their own money. And they had ample money. Everybody was working. They were prosperous. And King George III was lobbied by the Bank of England uh, to get those gosh darn colonials to use banknotes loaned at interest by the Bank of England. And so King George III passed his Currency Act that said the colonies have to use banknotes loaned at interest by the Bank of England. And in just a few years, the colonies were in the same poverty and hardship and squalor as London in the time of uh, Charles Dickens was. And it was really this that drove the people to the American Revolution. Uh, if you read the writings of people like Thomas Jefferson and Ben Franklin, uh, they're saying simply it was the refusal of King George to allow the use of an honest banking system that was the primary drive for the war. So they kicked out the Bank of England along with King George, and they started this new system of a government-issued currency that was not accruing interest to a banker, and it worked very well. And then almost immediately, uh, the bankers started coming on in and trying to set up uh, another form of bank that would loan uh, interest-bearing banknotes for commerce. And they succeeded in getting the first bank of the United States, which was then uh, uh, granted a 20-year charter. And at the end of the 20 years, Congress refused to renew the charter because they could see uh, how this, this bank was just impoverishing the American people to enrich itself. And they were literally threatened uh, by the head of the Rothschild banking family that if they did not renew the charter, that there would be a war. And sure enough, one year after the refusal to renew the charter, the War of 1812 began. And even though the United States eventually won the War of 1812, it had put them in so much debt they were forced to charter a new central bank, the second bank of the United States. And that one had a 20-year charter. And at the end of that 20 years, that's when Andrew Jackson was in office. And he campaigned for his second term in office on Jackson and no bank because everybody understood the reason for their poverty was they were being victimized by these bankers and their pieces of ink and paper. So Andrew Jackson succeeded in blocking the renewal of the charter of the Second Bank of the United States, whereupon there was an assassination attempt on him, uh, and it failed when both pistols failed to fire. Uh, but if you go to my website, whatreallyhappened.com, uh, up at the top there's a little gray box full of article headers, and you want to look at one called All Wars Are Bankers' Wars because it tells the history of the world and especially the United States in terms of the interaction with these private bankers. 
and you will find out that there was an economic uh, aspect to the assassination attempt on Andrew Jackson, uh, to the uh, assassination of Abraham Lincoln, even the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Uh, these private central bankers have been playing this scam on the human race for well over 300 years. It has made the Rothschild family immensely rich, and all it took was crooked politicians and ink and paper. And more and more people are beginning to realize that it is these private central banks that are the root cause of poverty, hungry, uh, hunger, suffering, and eventually war, because it's a three-step process. You set up a private central bank, and the instant that first pretty printed piece of paper goes into circulation, more money is owed to the central bank than actually exists. That is the debt trap. It doesn't matter how hard you work. It doesn't matter how much you sacrifice. You can never pay off the debt because the debt grows faster than the available money supply. And so the people will borrow and the people will borrow until finally they say, I can't borrow anymore. I'm struggling with the payments. But the, the private central bank needs to find more borrows to keep going. It's actually a pyramid scheme. So at that point, the Keynesian economists say the government must borrow on behalf of the people, and I might add without their permission. So the government borrows and borrows and borrows and spends until it reaches the point that it cannot borrow anymore. And at that point, the bankers will gin up a war because a war forces everybody to borrow more. And so at the end of the war, uh, they loan the money to fight the war, they loan the money to rebuild after the war, and after it's all over, ordinary people like you and I have more or less what we had before, except the graveyards are a lot bigger, but we are back to being debt slaves to those banks for the next hundred years. And that is why we have these endlessly repeating wars. Because the real value of a war is not the land or the assets of the country. The real value of the war is the debt that it produces for those banks. Because that is where they make most of their money. Bankers love wars. Wars are the richest harvest of debt for banks. And they don't care which side wins or loses. That's why you had Brown Brothers Harriman in New York City backing Adolf Hitler's rise to power until the day the war broke out and Roosevelt hit them with the Trading with the Enemies Act. And so I'm surprised that, that Iceland uh, hasn't been, you know, um, installed with a puppet regime by now or something, you know. I'm, well, I'm, sh I'm sure it's probably occurring to them, but it, it's kind of hard to gin up Iceland as being some kind of a threat uh, to the U.S. government. You know, what are they, what are they going to do, throw icicles at us? Uh, and uh, uh, so basically Iceland is being shunned. You don't hear about them much in the corporate media uh, because Iceland, at the end of that whole 2008 mortgage-backed security fraud, they did something very intelligent. They started throwing their criminal bankers in prison, and they wrote off all the debt that was created through fraud. And Iceland is doing really, really good. Now they're trying to get Iceland to join the European Union, and Iceland is saying, I don't think so, not looking at how the EU has worked out for the existing member states. And, and of course, another example from history is, um, well, 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 Germany leading up to World War II, of course, their, their economy was flourishing as well, right? They called it the German miracle with no yeah, private social... Ab absolutely. When the Nazis came to power... They uh, threw out the private central bank that had been imposed on Germany by the Treaty of Versailles at the end of World War I. And they went to a value-based currency, and of course Germany's economy lit up, and they became a manufacturing superpower. And this, again, was a threat to the nations that were enslaved to private central banks. Because nations that are enslaved to private central banks, where so much of the gross domestic product is simply being siphoned off, to the money junkies, they can't compete with nations that don't have private central banks. And so that's why everybody started saying, we're going to have another world war and we're going to slap down Germany because uh, they can't stand any nation without a private central bank. And if you look at this rush to go into Iran, uh, you see the same pattern. Iran does not have a private central bank. They don't allow uh, compound interest on loans. It's loan plus a flat fee. And that uh, is something that the private central bankers want to erase. They want a world where everybody believes that private central banks are the natural order of things. And they aren't. It's a fairly recent invention in human history. It's a fairly recent scam. And it has caused so much damage. And you know it's happened before. Because if you look at some of these ancient religions, like uh, Christianity originally, before the time of the Templars, and Islam, they forbid the usury of money. And they, they didn't just come up with that out of thin air. 
the people who were writing these scriptures had watched how interest had destroyed ancient civilizations, including Rome. And speaking of the, the Middle East, uh, well, er earlier we, we were uh, briefly mentioning Syria, and well, I, I, for most of the uh, reports on Syria uh, internationally, the, the big elephant in the living room no one's talking about is, I think, uh, Israel's interest in the Golan Heights. You know, I mean, like, the, the, I feel like most people aren't connecting the dots of how that, I think, is largely related as well, right, to why we're in Syria. Well, Israel is obviously playing its own game, and it's kind of interesting that you bring that up because uh, uh, it was 50 years ago when uh, Israel attacked the USS Liberty uh, that they were capturing the Golan Heights, uh, and it's been considered occupied territory since. Now Israel's claiming that it's uh, officially part of Israel, even though there's no foundation for that in uh, international law. And, uh, of course, the reason they want it uh, is Israel has territorial ambitions uh, called Eratz Israel, or Greater Israel. They want to create a, a modern nation of Israel uh, that conforms with the biblical description of Israel that reached from the Nile to the Euphrates, even though there is no archaeological evidence that there ever was an Israel that was that large. Uh, but it's just, it's part of their religious belief. If you look at the flag of Israel, the two lines at top and bottom in blue represent the Nile and the Euphrates. So they're out there listening to the voices in their head, thinking it's God, uh, and they're causing all kinds of mayhem in the process. You, you just had a, a very remarkable interview um, with those uh, two gentlemen on, on your program earlier uh, from the USS Liberty. And um, yeah, yeah, that was uh, also like, like one of the, I think, callers uh, mentioned was, yeah, also very, well, very emotional, definitely, to listen to these accounts. I mean, these gentlemen... They, they def definitely remember everything as if it were yesterday. Well, Phil Turney was a survivor of the attack, and uh, he's uh, written a very good book about it called Erasing the Liberty, uh, because for 50 years there has been this huge cover-up. Uh, Israel wanted to sink that ship. They machine-gunned the life rafts. They didn't want any survivors, and they only called off the attack when it became obvious that everybody knew it was Israel attacking that ship, and then they skedaddled. Uh, and it looks like Israel may have been concerned uh, that the Liberty was aware of Israel's move on the Golan Heights, uh, that the Liberty may have been aware that Israel was executing prisoners of war in Egypt, which is a war crime. Uh, the strongest theory is that Israel was trying to frame Egypt for the attack on the USS Liberty. While the attack was ongoing, Israel was sending messages to the U.S., Israel is attacking your ship, Israel is attacking your ship. And had the ship gone down, uh, uh, Israel would have said uh, it was Egypt, uh, Egypt did it, and would have drawn the United States into that war on the side of Israel against Egypt. And in point of fact, there actually was a nuclear armed flight in the air on the way to Cairo, which fortunately was recalled when the crew of the USS Liberty got a radio message out saying we're being attacked by Israeli forces. So, I mean, that's how close the, the, the world came uh, to a nuclear attack on, uh, on Egypt on Cairo. And uh, again, you need to understand the mindset of the Israeli government. It's best illustrated by the motto of the Mossad, which is their top secret spy organization. And their motto is, and it's from their, their religious scripture, by way of deception thou shalt do war. And that's basically it. They live by the dirty trick. And there's a gentleman named Victor Ostrovsky, and he's former Mossad. He lives in uh, uh, Arizona now. He's, uh, he's retired. He's become an artist. He has a gallery. But he's also written a couple of books about what the Mossad was like when he was there. And he talks about all these dirty tricks like how Israel smuggled a radio transmitter into Tripoli and used it to send bogus messages uh, that made it look like Gaddafi was going to launch massive terror attacks across the world. And it tricked Ronald Reagan into bombing Tripoli to bombing uh, uh, Gaddafi. And Gaddafi was totally innocent in this. Uh, they deliberately tried to get him. They missed him and killed his five-year-old daughter. But this is how Israel operates. By way of deception, thou shalt do war. And you need to be aware uh, of, uh, of the possibility of deception in any of these world events. I, I do have, uh, with the promotions for the show, and, and I'll have them in the archive as well, a number of links to your articles, including All Wars Are Bankers Wars, and uh, the article about the Liberty uh, also, I, I did have in there the one about, you have about the Levant affair. 
Uh, I don't know if you'd like to share a bit with the listeners about about that. Yeah, that's that's another classic case of by way of deception thou shalt do war. Uh, basically, this was taking place in Egypt, uh, and there were British and American uh, assets in Egypt were being bombed, and evidence was left uh, behind uh, to point the finger of blame at Egyptian Muslims. Then a one of the bombs detonated prematurely, and the police caught the bomber, who turned out to be an Israeli agent. And, of course, Israel at first said, oh, it's a plot by the anti-Semites to make us look bad. We would never do anything like that. And then finally, of course, Israel said, yeah, gee, shuckies, you got us. It was us. Uh, and uh, it was called the Levon Affair because uh, one of Israel's top ministers, Pinchon Levon, I think his name was, uh, took the blame for it, although it looks to me like he was actually uh, innocent and, and framed by his subordinates who carried out this operation without his permission. So uh, it's... Uh, uh, again, there, there's a lot of that. The bombing of the King David Hotel was done by Israelis dressed as Arabs. It's just how they operate. Uh, Israel, in fact, maintains a, s a separate military unit uh, that literally eats, lives, sleeps, dresses like Arabs so that they can infiltrate other Arab nations at any time and be immediately accepted as genuine in order to carry out some of these false flag attacks. And then we have a lot in the independent media who are getting pushed toward blaming Saudi Arabia for 9-11 in the past. Now, I was shocked when they started trying to blame Iran now for 9-11. Um, I, I, isn't uh, some international, I, I don't know, someone was trying to say that they should pay money for it, even though there's no evidence. Um, and uh, Yeah, that, 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 that's kind of a, a, a scam situation where they're trying to get these lawsuits uh, through the courts in the United States, where they simply declare, we think Saudi Arabia was to blame for 9-11, therefore we can sue them for money. And the judges are going along with it in the hope that if people see in the newspaper, oh, lawsuit says Saudi Arabia was responsible for 9-11, that they'll just think it must be true. Well, we know that judges do not necessarily uh, deal in the reality or the truth. I mean, every one of those convictions for witchcraft that led to uh, people being burned at the stake were solid in logic and law, and yet we know they were all boneheaded decisions. But 9-11 is sort of this one-stop rubber stamp. Anyway, anyone they want to invade, oh, they were involved in 9-11. First it was Afghanistan was behind 9-11. We invade them. Oh, we were wrong. No, it was Iraq was behind 9-11. Uh, rubber, uh, no, it wasn't them. Oh, it must be Saudi Arabia. Rubber stamp that. Now they're talking about Iran. Everybody they want to invade, they say, oh, it's a terror hotbed. They have links to 9-11. As far as Saudi Arabia is concerned, again, you have to look for what should be there and isn't. You need to look for a motive, okay? Saudi Arabia has made huge amounts of money off the petrodollar deal. They have vast amounts of that money invested back in the United States, and they certainly do not want to give the United States government an excuse to, to seize those assets. OK, and if Saudi Arabia wanted to hurt the United States, they do not need to crash airplanes into skyscrapers to do it. All they have to do is ask for all their money back and the U.S. economy would pop like a soap bubble. So it wasn't Saudi Arabia and it wasn't Iran. Iran has not launched a war of aggression against another country in over 200 years. It's not their nature. In fact, just for all this talk about Saddam's nuclear weapons and Iran's nuclear weapons and North Korea's nuclear weapons, we need to keep in mind that only one nation in history has actually used nuclear weapons of mass destruction against the civilians of another country. And that is, of course, the United States of America. And so if you look back over these last 13, 14 years, who is it who's doing all the invading, drone striking, the torturing, the regime changing, the coup d'etats? It's not Saudi Arabia, it's not Iran, it's not Russia, and it's not China. It's the United States of America, with Israel as a close second, who can't seem to go for six months without invading one of their neighbors. And, and as far as anyone who's really looked into 9-11, um, it, it seems the most accurate way to put it would be that it was a joint effort by the U.S., Israel, and, and perhaps uh, England as well. Isn't that, isn't that pretty much I, I would say that's a pretty uh, good assessment. I don't know how involved... Uh, uh, Great Britain was, but definitely a joint U.S. Uh, Mossad uh, operation. And uh, uh, again, uh, they, they, they do these things uh, to try and get the wars going. Uh, a good example would be the sinking of the Lusitania that angered Americans into uh, the willingness to join the Great War in Europe. 
And the Lusitania was smuggling weapons to Great Britain, even though at that time the United States was officially neutral. And Germany knew they were using the Lusitania to smuggle weapons. And in point of fact, the German government actually took out ads in the newspapers in New York saying, do not sail on the Lusitania. It is carrying contraband. It is a legal target of war, and we will sink her. And so they still got a bunch of passengers to go on the Lusitania. Maybe the discount of the tickets said, don't worry, you'll be perfectly safe. Then they sail the Lusitania into an area off the coast of Ireland where they know there's all kinds of U-boats, did not have an escort. So, of course, it gets sunk. And immediately, uh, all mention of the fact that Lusitania was smuggling weapons is erased from the media. Oh, those dastardly Germans, they sunk an innocent passenger ship with a great loss of life. And everybody said, oh, those dastardly Germans, and they marched off into World War I. Same thing here uh, d during World War II. The conventional story is the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor it was a complete and total surprise. No reason to do it whatsoever. Gosh darn, we're going to go after Japan as soon as we get done uh, mucking about with Germany. But the historical record is that Roosevelt spent all of 1941 deliberately goading and provoking the government of Japan. And he was following an eight-step plan that was written by Office of Naval Intelligence Lieutenant Commander Arthur H. McCollum. And to the uh, ordinary American, these provocations would have looked minor. But to the Japanese sensibilities, they were absolutely deadly insults. And they, uh, Roosevelt knew... Uh, the attack was coming. Uh, the uh, Japanese fleet was not maintaining radio silence. It was being tracked by government listening posts uh, all along the West Coast, down in Australia. Even the passenger ship, the SS Lurline, which was run by the Matson Steamship Company, that's what would bring passengers to Hawaii before the days of, of, of aviation. Their radio man, Leslie Grogan, was picking up the Japanese fleet, and he plotted their position on a map. And the, the uh, Lurline got into Pearl Harbor, on December 4th, and he turned over his map and charts to the Office of Naval uh, Intelligence and said, there's a big honking Japanese attack force out there. And, of course, it was all hushed up. Oh, my goodness, Pearl Harbor is a uh, tremendous surprise. Uh, there was the mini-sub sunk by the ward. Uh, for years and years, they kept saying, oh, no, the, the, we had no way of knowing the Japanese were coming. Uh, the ward was shooting at a dolphin. And then finally, a few years ago, the University of Hawaii oceanographic people, they actually found the remains of the mini-sub that was sunk by the ward. And it's just lie after lie after lie after lie. Torpedoes in the Gulf of Tonkin, Spanish mine in Havana Harbor. That, all wars have to begin with a lie. There's no leader that could get up there and tell his population, I think I want to go to war with this other country. I want to go on in there, and I want to steal all their, their, their beautiful things and their gold and their jewels and bring it back here uh, for myself, and I need your kids to go on out there and do this for me. And the people would say, of course not. We're not going to do that. War is very dirty, poorly paying business, uh, and you have a chance of losing important bits of your body. We're going to stay home. So any world leader that wants to start a war, they have to lie to their people and create this illusion that going to war is the only way that they're going to stay alive. Uh, Hitler did it at Glywitz, Germany. Faked a Polish attack on the radio station, said, oh, we must retaliate. That's how these things are always starting. And the U.S. government's been doing it over and over and over again. And they're probably going to do it again. There'll be another false flag to really ramp things up again. And it'll probably even be something that's even bigger than airplanes crashing into skyscrapers because we've already been there, done that, didn't buy the T-shirt. But that's... That's the only card they have left to play. Something so big and scary that everybody will say, I don't even want to think about it. Just take my money. Take my children. Save me from the evil, whoever it is we're supposed to be saved from this week. And you mentioned um, in the past, uh, the, well, the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, came really close to a nuclear exchange. Um, as far as uh, this time around, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know. It's kind of crazy, I think, for the U.S. to actually expect that Russia would not retaliate if they were hit, you would have to think. I agree. I absolutely agree. Now, I, I keep bringing up the Cuban Missile Crisis because we got out of that one with our planet intact because both Kennedy and Khrushchev knew for a fact that each other did not want a nuclear war. It was really unthinkable. The, the memories of what the uh, atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki had done were still fresh in everybody's mind. It's a little removed from the current generation. Uh, and they didn't want to do that. Today, it's very different. You have all these people running around 
uh, saying, yeah, let's just go ahead and do a nuke strike on North Korea. Let's do a nuke strike on Russia. Let's do this and let's do that. And so over in Russia, you have their military commanders. They're not really sure about the state of mind of America's military leaders or our president. They're kind of wondering if we're all doped up on prescription antidepressants or if there's something in the water that's making us all go crazy and nutty. But they don't know for a fact that our leadership doesn't want to go nuclear, and that's going to make it more likely that they'll hit that button at the first provocation. And we have well, so many factors, like, like we've been mentioning here. Um, well, how broke the U.S. is and, and wants an excuse, you know, a war to blame it on, the, the, mil the military-industrial complex, which profits from war, the private central banks that want to keep everyone under their thumb, intimidated at the you know, sometimes even just as a uh, as a preventative measure. And and then, well, we mentioned greater Israel and, and the uh, the Golan Heights uh, interest of Israel as as well. So, I mean, yeah, with too many factors right now, want war in the West. Doesn't that seem to be? Yeah, that that's there. There are too many uh, world leaders who think uh, war is their best option uh, simply because they can't think of any other way uh, to get out of the mess they've gotten into. And, and that seems to be a tragically repeating cycle in human history. And, and, and these people who are pushing toward a global system, they do seem to be a lot of the same ones who, who want these wars. Um, and then I know of these organizations of people like George Soros. Um, he's, we're seeing so much of the far left now being pushed to the center in mainstream, in the, in the corporate media. Um, I generally don't even say mainstream anymore. I'll say independent media and corporate media. But yeah, I, that's, uh, those that's, are the labels that I like to use as well. Well, yeah. the corporate media uh, is, is very much on board uh, with the far left uh, and with the globalists. And I think nothing illustrates that more than the way they have responded to the hearings in the Senate committee yesterday and today, where basically it came on out. There is no proof that Russia interfered with our elections last year. Donald Trump never ordered anybody to stop an investigation. Uh, nobody in Donald Trump's administration ever asked anybody to stop an investigation. Uh, it was Loretta Lynch uh, who basically uh, pressured uh, Comey uh, to sort of tone down the investigation into Hillary's email server by describing it as an affair rather than an investigation. And yet the corporate media is still out there saying, well, you know, Comey felt pressure from Donald Trump to end the investigations. And they're still out there spinning all these headlines to just try and damage Trump as much as possible. And unfortunately for people who were not able to watch the hearings or who are not going to watch the replay or read the transcript, they're looking at those headlines and thinking that the, the end result of these hearings uh, was that Donald Trump did all these really, really bad things. But he didn't when they were pushed right to it. Comey under oath said, no, there was no obstruction of justice. And you've, you've mentioned a lot of the... Um well, at least the origins that were misguided uh, for the principles of the, uh, well, I guess what we could term here is the far left, what it's become today, at least. Um, but I, on your show, a lot you you'll, you'll mention uh, coming of age in Samoa, and yes. and how, yeah, maybe you could explain for my listeners um, just how that. All right. Well, basically, um, coming of uh, early liberalism. Uh, was this idea that, that government could and should control as much of your life as possible for your betterment. Uh, this was opposed to the original conservatism, or paleoconservatism, that the government that governs least governs best, uh, which is kind of my background. So this uh, young lady, anthropologist Margaret Mead, decided she was going to go on and, 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 and document just how much of a person's behavior was from their society and environment, uh, versus how much they were born with. And she went on down to the island of Samoa, which w was very, very remote, still remote today, not as remote, but, but, but very remote down there. And she basically uh, came back with this idea that the Samoan adolescents did not go through the emotional turmoil of adolescents in the United States. Uh, therefore, that emotional turmoil had to be a product of the environment and if we could change the environment, we could uh, improve the emotional turmoil of young people. And this idea that human minds are born absolutely blank and that everything that we think, feel, believe, and know is brought in from outside is the core founding justification for the liberal political philosophy.
of tinkering with everything about your life. The problem was coming of age in Samoa was an intellectual fraud. Margaret Mead went on down there and she just met these two girls and she was asking them these leading questions and she made several very bad assumptions about Samoa. If you read the book, she talks about Samoa being uh, a totally sexually promiscuous society because at that time here in Hawaii was a totally sexually promiscuous society. But Samoa was different. Each one of the Polynesian islands is a separate culture with their own rules. So you can't make an assumption about one island based on what's going on over this other. So that was one of the biggest mistakes she made. And the Samoan people, like Polynesians everywhere, uh, they love to talk story. And to be polite, these girls basically went along with what Margaret Mead was suggesting. And that was the entire basis. Margaret Mead wrote her book, went on back home, helped establish modern liberalism, still lionized today by the liberals. But this is the reason so many of these liberal projects fail utterly because it's all based on a bogus first principle, whether it's trying to blend gender or, uh, or, 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 or any of these other aspects. They're ignoring the fact that we are born with certain inherent instinctive behaviors and feelings, and they're not going to go away anytime soon. And that's why the liberals keep botching these things up time after time after time. And they still won't go back and admit that Margaret B. Mead's book is a fraud. The governor of Samoa actually tracked down these two women and interviewed them and came on out with a report saying the book is absolute intellectual nonsense. And it's actually been criticized and torn apart by other anthropologists who said that Mead just didn't know what she was talking about. She didn't go down there to find out what was going on in Samoa. She went down there to basically uh, uh, write a book that supported a foregone conclusion, a desired political outcome. And that's why liberalism uh, is in such trouble, because they keep pushing and pushing and pushing against the law of diminishing returns. And they don't understand. They will not understand. They believe that they're on the path to success, and they, 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 they react very negatively uh, to any counter-arguments. In fact, looking at the modern liberals, especially as they were acting right after Trump's election victory, they remind me a lot of the Scientologists. Uh, who are willing to go along with harassment of people and all these illegal actions that they do because in their head they believe that in the long run they are making the planet Earth a better place. And that kind of self-deception is behind so much of history's atrocities, whether it's the burning of the witches uh, or, or, or pogroms or anything, the, this true believer mentality. Uh, and uh, liberalism seems less and less like a political movement and more and more like a religious cult. And certainly that was underscored by the fact that Hillary Clinton ran her, uh, her presidential campaign last year um, as if it was a personality cult. It was all about her. It was all about her. It was all about the woman card. It was all about the, the race card. She never actually came out with any concrete suggestions and policies how she was going to fix what was wrong with the nation. It was just this idea that if we have a woman president, everything will be just fine, which is a repeat of what we had uh, eight years previously, where if we finally elect a black president, everything will be fine. And it wasn't. Yeah, well, the, um, the people in power and uh, backing the money behind the corporate media seem to, to want to definitely use the, agenda, the attitudes of the far left these days to, to promote their, their, uh, well, their globalist um, just just furthering of their greed really yes um, and and it seems like a lot of social engineering therefore it gets tied to to these agendas um i, I keep up a lot with this one uh, gentleman's uh, swedish radio program he's had a lot of guests in there and i've, I've actually had a few uh, guests from sweden or or have, who have lived there um and native swedes and it, it, it is amazing i know you've been speaking about it as well um because it does seem like that area, uh, Sweden, uh, Denmark, uh, are a testing ground, a, like a testing lab for a lot of these extreme so social engineering changes in the schools and and policies. Um, and, and like, well, when they do get to places like the states and and Europe, um, well, I know here in America, it does seem like California is one of the first places. But uh, the and the campuses, of course, in general, and schools, even even younger schools, seem like the the place. A lot of it's starts out you know but um yeah it's not about education anymore it's about indoctrination and uh they're, they're showing uh, uh academic tests american students are doing very poorly compared to the rest of the world 
Uh, they're doing uh, testing of critical thinking on college students and finding out that in four years of university, they're not learning how to think critically. They're not learning how to be logical. They're not learning how to analyze. And that is the primary thing you're supposed to learn when you go to those advanced uh, levels of education. And, and so we have these, well, I don't know, th just these focuses really on... Well, I, 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 I don't know. It, it seems like just trying to change the way people, people's um, values are is really what the schools are more about these days, you know. And of course, like they're trying to get them to, you know, not uh, listen to the independent media, even right. In, in oh yeah, oh, oh yeah. They're 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 adding curriculum to the public schools about why you should only trust the corporate news networks and you should never go on out and read anything that's not approved by the government. Uh, and along with this uh, gender fluidity nonsense. But we're seeing a clear pushback. I, I think this idea of, of uh, uh, using whatever bathroom you feel like you are on the inside, that triggered a real reaction against political correctness. Uh, and I, I think the fact that it has gone to such an extreme now is a symptom of the fact that it is losing traction with the ordinary American people uh, who are perfectly happy with the, the gender that they know they are uh, and, and they we're, we're seeing this ridiculousness where the so-called transgender boy uh, is being allowed to compete in girls athletic events and of course he's winning them all and we're supposed to sit around and say oh well that's okay because inside uh, he's really a girl no he isn't if you take his DNA and you run it a test it's a guy and uh, the, the uh, we seem to have this idea that politics can override science, and we see that in this gender issue. We even see it in the global warming debate, where they're out there saying, if the politicians are saying it's warming, by golly, it's warming, and we will conform our policy to that. Uh, the, re the religion of Al Gore, right? Yeah, the, the, the St. Al of the Gore. <laughs> and it's, it, it's amazing. I mean, Mammoth Mountain in California got so much snow this last winter, they're going to be open until August. Oh, and and then we have uh, you mentioned science, and oh, I, I've been thinking a lot about the uh, pharmaceutical industry. As always, I, I once heard a great interview with this woman uh, called. Uh, well, the book she wrote was Confessions, Confessions of an RX Drug Pusher, and she used to like wine and dine doctors to you know push her pharmaceuticals, basically. You know, and and they I know they don't test anything anymore, right? It, it's 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 getting really bad out there, right? Yeah, basically the FDI uh, sits on back and they'll accept the testing data produced by the pharmaceutical uh, companies themselves, which is very often fraudulent. Uh, we had that whistleblower that came forward and said the CDC's report that claimed to prove there was no link between vaccines and autism was an absolute hoax and a fraud. Uh, apparently the state of Ohio has just sued five pharmaceutical companies, including Johnson & Johnson, for literally encouraging doctors to write more prescriptions for opiate painkillers for their patients uh, in order to turn them all into addicts and guaranteed revenue. And apparently the last year they've got numbers for 2012. Uh, they wrote so many of these prescriptions, it worked out to 66 pills for every living people, uh, person in the state of Ohio. That's a lot of opiates. And that shows you the basic attitude. Keep you addicted, keep you uh, uh, dependent, and just make as much money from you as they can. And only pretend that you care about health, uh, as well as with these um, nuclear incidents, right? Aside from Fukushima now, there's this uh, Hanford uh, situation? Yeah, well, Hanford is, has been a problem for a very, very long time. And uh, again, being in a wartime economy, uh, certain critical infrastructure is not being maintained. And so over at Hanford, they have these uh, uh, processing plants that extract plutonium from spent reactor fuel rods so that they can make bombs with them. Uh, and uh, apparently the spent fuel rods are stored in these tunnels, and the tunnels have not been maintained, and now there have been a couple of cave-ins with an associated release of radiation. Well, so, yeah, it's like you say, it's uh, all about profit, um, both for these these drug companies, vaccine companies, and also for these power companies as well. Um, yes. And, and, and will you mention that the, uh, well, the, I don't know if it was you who was mentioning, but I mean, I know that the means of uh, producing uh, fuel the way they do, they, they wind up getting, yeah, I think you were mentioning like, you know, bomb making material as a byproduct. So they wouldn't want to convert to any other fuel methods that could be better for everyone else. Yeah, there, there's an uh, alternative system out there called the thorium cycle, 
uh, and it's a, 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 other nations are already starting to build thorium cycle reactors, uh, but it's much cleaner, much less toxic than uranium fission. Uh, and thorium is uh, very abundant in the crust of the earth. It's not like you have to go looking for it all that, that much. Uh, but uh, thorium cycle reactors do not produce materials that can be used to make atomic bombs, and that's why the United States is still totally focused on fission uh, uranium reactors out of which they can get plutonium uh, to make bombs with. And that's, that, that's really what is keeping us using this very, very dangerous technology. I did find one um, positive uh, insight on science you had recently about... Uh, Richard, oh. Richard, I had to share another thing with Michael. You know, it's, I'm going to appreciate your guess, but you're talking about Hanford. <clears throat> I had a uh, contract with Westinghouse back when I was running SK Industries, and they, they wanted to give me a million dollars to create a laser that they, would, they, would, they could use to bore a hole in the ground and that they could analyze the vapor of the material that was being vaporized and for the de and detect radiation. And this was back uh, in the early in the early nineties, relatively early nineties. So, and the idea was that this was during the Clinton administration. Okay, and so what they did was they detected that the uh, groundwater and the ground was so contaminated around the perimeter of Hanford that what uh, Clinton did of course if you recall is he made a he expanded the natural per, the perimeter around it and he called it a uh, wilderness area or a reserve or some a national park something of this nature yeah but to, to hide the radiation yes Crazy. no they they can't clean up the mess uh, it's the most contaminated spot on the face of the earth uh, it, it's it's uh, spread out over a much wider area than you have in Chernobyl uh, or Fukushima. Uh, but in some total, uh, it, it's a horribly irradiated area, and nobody wants to spend the money to clean it on up. Uh, we're just going to let it sit there like they're doing with Fukushima. They're never really going to be able to solve that. Everything that they're doing uh, is just a PR stunt to make it look like they're trying to deal with the aftermath of Fukushima. But it's still there. It's still radioactive. And now Japan is telling people, well, it's time for you to go back home and start working in the farms and fields and uh, going back to being loyal taxpayers. Ah, that's amazing. Stephen, Stephen yeah. I, know, I know you've worked for, um, well, uh, different uh, yeah, yeah, all of com them. companies. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, well, contractor for um, your uh -huh. lasers that were very high-end uh, you know, laser sites and everything. And Michael here has worked for NASA in his past, both well, very high-end. Uh, NASA was a customer of mine. NASA okay. bought lasers for me. Okay. Um, they all, everybody bought lasers for me. I sold lasers to every university, every space organization, every corporation, every car manufacturer, everybody. E everything down to a little university in, in, in India or something. Stephen, do you have any question for Michael about NASA? He's, he's worked on uh, Viking and Voyager in, in, when he was with NASA. Well, you know, Michael, you know, remember when NASA used to put out that nice magazine that they used to give out to everybody, NASA, whatever it was, and if you were in the industry, see, but that was part of their charters that they had to disseminate the information. Yes, yeah, and, I remember that. Uh, yeah, uh, I got that. I used to get that magazine, and I used to enjoy it a lot because there's always little tidbits in there that you wouldn't get. Uh, you know, that was like Industrial Physicist magazine. They don't put that out anymore either. But yeah, it's all it's all been grabbed up. You know, a, a lot of one of the reasons I support Donald Trump's. A renewed push for NASA to go back out into space and, and stop hanging around Al Gore uh, is because I'm old enough to remember that tech boom, uh, that golden age of the 70s, 80s, and 90s all came out of solving the problems to go to the moon with Apollo. And we need a new civilian technology incubator that's going to be developing these things, uh, disseminating to the public with magazines and so forth without charging for it. Uh, because the technology incubators we have today are all military, and by the time they allow what they develop to come on out, uh, it's really past the point of being uh, useful for uh, anything. But Here, the here's civilian. A, this is a great. This is a great segue, Michael, for something I wanted to ask you earlier. I grew okay. up in Seal Beach, okay, and that's where they built the second stages for the Apollo. So, yes. so obviously, you know, we were weaned on that stuff at a young age, you know, and so I have a real hard time with the. Uh, <clears throat> The flat earthers and the uh, fake moon landing types. Uh, 
Yeah. And again, remember, I worked in optics, and one of the companies I worked for, we made corner cubes that are sitting on the surface of the moon right now. And it, oh, I have bounced lasers off of those exa- corner cubes. Yeah, so you know what I'm talking about. So I really have a problem when people go, yeah, they're not there. Or when they admit they're there, then they go, well, a robot put them there. And I'm like, oh. Well, you need to understand this kind of stuff is being poured all over the Internet by the government to try and make us look like we're a bunch of kooks and crazies whether it's the flat earth one, the fake Apollo moon landings, chemtrails, and all the, you know, uh, Loch Ness monster and Bigfoot's love child and Elvis up in his UFO. And it, it's, it's called poisoning the well. It's very old propaganda uh, technique. And, yeah, they, they keep on doing that because that's the, the, the corporate media and the government can't start telling the truth. All they can do is try and level the playing field by finding ways to damage our credibility. And so that's where a lot of this nonsense comes from. The hollow earth people, they're coming, they're, they're in a resurgence right now. Well, the hollow earth, I don't have so much problem with because of all the Nazi connections, and it's, it's, <laughs> it's kind of interesting, the new Schwabenland and all that. The flat earth people, they're the ones that, you know, because if you look at, like, physicists like, um, what's his name, Nassim Harriman, a lot of his stuff that's becoming, be, going to be becoming mainstream seems to support some of these uh, possibilities, you know, physically. I, I think of it like a geode. I think the Earth is kind of like a geode myself, but uh, you know what I'm talking about, a geode, right? Yeah, I know what a geode is. Uh, we're going to have to agree to disagree on this one. We're starting to uh, run out of time here, so... Uh, <laughs> Look at you. Yeah, yeah, it's my show coming up next, Michael. I should have okay. you as a guest. Hey, listen, Michael... Uh, um, I've got to do something after the show. I'm sorry. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to waste your time, but I do... If, if anything I want to walk away with before I let you go is uh, the, the whole Occupy the Getty thing, because I know you're talking about bunkers, and I know... Uh, to me, the bunkers are the key to everything. You can't change anything on the surface without removing the scum that's underneath us. Well, you know, if, if the worst happens and they go on down to their bunkers, I figure we'll just cement over the hatches. Ha, 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 but they got those big drilling machines. They'll just pop up somewhere else like a gopher. We'll, we'll, we'll use more cement. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know. Hopefully they don't have all the buttons to the, the launchers down there. They probably do, huh? Yeah, they probably do. <clears throat> well, but they'll have already I, I want to go guys. down there. I believe that there's slaves down there that need to be rescued, and, uh, and you know all the wealth of the world that they've stolen over the last thousands of years is down there, too. I'd like to get that back, personally. All righty. Well, uh, when we reach that point, we'll get back together again and work out our plans. Uh-huh. All right. Yeah, certainly. Well, Michael, um, are there any uh, any finishing you know, points that you'd like to... we got about five minutes left, so I don't, okay. I don't know what you'd like to finish up with. Well, basically, uh, to all of your uh, listeners out there, we're obviously in a time of tremendous crisis, chaos, and danger. Uh, and now is not the time uh, to be silent. Uh, or polite. I would point out the lesson of the so-called good German who in World War II, uh, s- scared by the Gestapo or, or just out of a misguided sense of loyalty, the people of Germany who understood the country had gone in a wrong direction, they chose to remain silent. They figured that if they didn't make a fuss, whatever was going to happen would not affect them. And of course, they were wrong because they lost their country. And so I don't want to see a repeat. I don't want to see the good Americans who, even though they realize the U.S. government has gone in a very dangerous direction out of some misguided loyalty or sense of politeness, they decide to stay quiet. This is a time when all Americans need to speak on out to their friends, neighbors, co-workers, and saying, we're in a really serious situation. We have a government that has messed up our country and economy, and they're thinking that the only way they can get out of it is with a world war because they can't think of any other solution and we're going to lose this one. So that would, be, uh, that, that would be my advice to everybody out there. Yeah, it would, it would be good if the government could collapse on its own accord before we go to the point of ha uh, That's, what I'm, That's what, yeah. what I'm hoping for. That's what I'm hoping for, Soviet Union-style collapse. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it seems like everyone else in the world is, is being pretty sane. Uh, I know now uh, North Korea and South Korea might, might merge, right? Uh, They're talking. They're talking. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, well, we'll see, Michael. Um, you know, you do great work, and um, yeah, everyone, please check out um, the website and 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 your show. I I do have all the links uh, provided up there for everyone, and um, well, uh, you know, you you've done just an extraordinary amount. Uh, I I I do hope that you continue and. Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe we can change things 
But I, uh, I thank you for your time here tonight. Oh, thank you for having me. All right. Excellent. Well, yeah, we'd love to, love to do it again. And um, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, if we ever uh, have you uh, in the States here, if there's ever a convention that Truth Cat Radio, uh, we've been talking about someday having, you know, conventions where a bunch of people could speak at it. Um, so yeah, if, if you ever wind up in the States and it could work out, you know, who knows, maybe we could get you to do well, something. Well, Claire like and I would like to move back to the mainland. We're very concerned here that if we do get into a hot war with Russia and China, it's inevitable this island will get hit. And so Claire and I have been talking about getting back to the mainland. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, uh, finding a way to uh, pay for it all. Well, I, I wish you the best of luck with that. And, and yeah, yeah, I hope, hope everything does work out for the best. All right. Thank well, uh, yes. All right, well, um, it, well, it's been great having you. And um, yeah, I guess um, well, well, I'll bid you good night, sir. And until next time, just have a, have a, great, have a great evening. All right, thanks. Same to you. Uh, look forward to the next time. All right, thank you. And everyone else out there, that has been Michael Rivero of the What Really Happened radio show. And he uh, has an amazing website as well, whatreallyhappened.com, has a, a brilliant uh, merging of a lot of people's sources of information, uh, which Michael has been the webmaster of. And I do recommend you check both of those out, which I have the links for uh, right now. We're, we're gonna we're gonna fly Steven. Michael in from Hawaii to come to our Vegas event. Hi, Richard. Is that oh. what we're gonna do? <laughs> Put him up in the in a casino hotel. Oh, that's uh, okay, right? That's what we do with the celebrities, right? If we can, yeah, definitely, <laughs> Michael. We're not that rich, but we would end up doing have to do something like that. We might do that. That's that's the only fair thing, right? Well, hope, it, 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 the the problem is it is so expensive to get uh, uh, from Hawaii to the mainland. I, I I think the last time I actually spoke at a, a conference was the tenth anniversary of nine eleven, where which was held in New York, and that was a bit of a thrill because we were literally off Broadway. Uh, but that's another reason we'd like to get back to the mainland to make it easy and feasible for me to get on out and do some more public speaking. All right. Sorry for interrupting, but anyway, thanks for being here. Um, Richard, go ahead and finish off, and I'll, I'll see you next time, Michael. Okay. Okay, Michael. Well, um, yeah, as I said, um, thank you for your, your time, and um, yeah, I do uh, you know, look forward to keeping up with, with everything you bring us in, in future. Uh, I, I, don't, I, I guess you pretty much said your, your, your final thoughts there. Um, I, I, I did... I did want to mention to everyone out there um, that we do need your support. Um, so please donate. Um, we have PayPal available uh, at truthcatradio.com's support page. Uh, so please help us out if you can. It I'm sorry, Richard. I keep sending you little messages. I hear him stop talking. It's like, uh, and I hear the little bloop, bloop, Richard. You got to turn off the little sounds from your, uh, or whoever, you know, oh. it'll, it'll, yeah, I'll have to do sounds that. popping up. Bloop, bloop. Very but that should be all for the night, folks. Uh, stick around for the Stephen D. Kelly show uh, coming up in just a few moments here. Until next time, transcend the construct. Regards.